Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's presentation and lecture. I think the uh, voting with your feet suggests this is a popular topic. I'm very pleased to see such a great turnout for this event. My name is uh, Professor Todd Landman. I'm the uh, faculty PBC for Social Sciences here at University of Nottingham, and I welcome you on behalf of the faculty and on behalf of the School of Sociology and Social Policy. Tonight's guest is well known to many of you, hence the turnout, I think. Uh, his work is well known, and uh, tonight he's going to talk to us about economic inequality and our grandchildren's future. The plan is for Danny to speak for about 40 or 45 minutes and then have a question and answer period afterwards. And we have people here with microphones uh, who will come to you. Uh, so there'll be a little bit of a delay in terms of asking the question, but we do want people to articulate their questions so that everyone can hear. And I'll be a bit draconian in chairing that session about limiting you to one question each and the strategy of uh, making a rant and then asking what do you think is not actually a question. So we do want a question that does have a, a putative answer. That's always helpful in, in venues and events like this. So I do, do hope you can live with those parameters that I've set for you. Um, the event is also streaming. Uh, so we have a live streaming and that might suggest uh, another limit on what you ask, because the whole world is watching. Uh, so we'll just see how that goes. Um, so Danny joins us from the University of Oxford. He's uh, the Halford Mackinder Professor of Geography uh, at Oxford. He grew up in Oxford uh, and went to university in, in Newcastle. And he's, he's worked in various universities around the UK, uh, Newcastle, Bristol, Leeds, Sheffield, but also has spent time in New Zealand. Uh, and with a group of colleagues, he helped create the website worldmapper.org. And I suggest you go onto that website after the talk to see what's on offer there. And that shows who has the most and least in the world in very interesting ways. Much of his work is available open access uh, on dannydorling.org. Again, I advise you to check out the website. Uh, and his work concerns issues of housing, health, employment, education, and poverty. He has books entitled Unequal Health, Population 10 Billion, The Social Atlas of Europe, All That is Solid, Inequality, and the 1%. And in this year, 2015, he brings us Injustice, Why Social Inequality Still Persists. So if you could give him a nice Nottingham welcome, Danny Dorling. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming. Can you hear me at the back? Great. Some people can hear me at the back. That's good. Uh, I'm going to try and be optimistic. I have done a talk like this a few times in the last few months, and people often complain at the end, you began by saying you're going to try and be optimistic. Uh, but I, re I really will, um, because we have lots of problems, but I think we are able to surmount our problems. We are one of the richest countries in the world. I don't think we are fundamentally stupid. I don't think our grandchildren should have a terrible future. But I do think we have to look at the direction in which many things are going to avoid them having a bad future. And I'll try and show you what some of those things are. I'm going to show you comparisons between countries. I'm a geographer, and so this is my trick. I use what's going on in different places as a way to say what is possible, and also to say whether what is happening in this country is necessarily inevitable. This uh, is the only map I'm afraid you're going to see, if you, if you come from a geography department. It's a strange map. It's a map of the world in which we've uh, stretch the map so that everybody gets an equal amount of space. Areas proportional uh, to population. I can't draw these maps anymore. This is actually drawn by somebody called Ben Hennig, who has an even much, much better website than mine called Views of the World. So if you want to see the future of cartography, look at Views of the World and have, see what's happening there. This is a map of 7.2 billion people. A map like this has been the screensaver of my computer for about 20 years. So I'm used to these kinds of maps. And I'm also used to seeing a world where you have everybody represented. 
and over time it becomes a much less frightening world. People often get scared about what is happening. We're adding another billion to the population in the next 12 years. It's very easy to think that the world is out of control, that we're going to burn the planet up. We've had it. When you look at images like this and spend some time looking at them, you begin to realise that 7.2 isn't necessarily that big a number of people. If I could make uh, this map the size of this entire screen, I could point to you streets in Tokyo that you could actually see, that if you've been lucky enough to go to Tokyo, you might have visited. The great news about the world population is that although the number is going up, the rate at which we're having children is slowing dramatically, absolutely hugely. The main reason we may get to 10 billion people, the UN think 11 billion, I think you're more likely at 9. It's not because we're having more babies. It's because people like me are not dying. It is ageing. The bulk of the extra 3 billion people to come are not actually new people, they are old people who are already here. So at some time, maybe in our grandchildren's lifetimes, almost certainly in our grandchildren's lifetimes, world population is going to stop rising for the first time since the Black Death. Not due to a disease or a catastrophe, but basically because billions and billions of women have said no. Men tend to want an extra half a child uh, than women want, if you put things very statistically. That, that is very good news. Peak baby in the world was 1990. <coughs> Peak number of babies ever born was 1990. Fertility rates going down. Peak baby 1990 means we have an awfully high number of 25 year olds now. You might have noticed around Europe and a high number of people coming into Europe. Thankfully for Europe, because Europe peaked baby was a long time before 1990. But that's all I'm going to talk about the rest of the world. I'm going to now just worry about rich countries. I have written too many books. Um, I've written books on housing, and I've written books on health, and I've written a book on the 1%. Probably an extremely boring cover. I'll show you the more exciting cover that I turned down in a minute for that book. Um, and a book, if you have trouble getting to sleep, called Injustice. And again, with Ben Hennig, Hennig and my colleague Demetrius Ballas, a book on Europe, because I think it might be useful for people to know something about Europe if you're deciding whether to leave it or not. Oh, if you do a quiz, we should put a big map of Europe up and see who can actually name which countries are which. There's a lot of them now in the EU. Um, and about 10 billion and the population of the world, and about what happened after the crash in 2008 with Beth and Thomas on Bank of Britain, and about what happens along tube lines in London, and about what a more equal world might look like. But these books all have something in common, and I don't think it's because I've got an obsession, but it might be. But at the bottom of them, when they say there is a problem, when they say in some countries people are still having more babies than the women actually want to have, when you say there is a problem with actually housing people in a country like Britain, you keep on coming back to the basic fundamental reason for this, which is what is unusual about our country when it comes to housing is that some people have so much and some have so little. We actually have a lot of housing, as I'll show you in a few minutes. What happens in countries which do have relatively high fertility is you have very high economic inequality. If you just look at the rich world, the highest fertility in the rich world is in the United States, the only country in the rich world which was managing until a couple of years ago to have more than two children per couple. The lowest fertility in the rich world is in places like Japan, not far off one child per couple. One child per couple is a halving in a generation and a halving again. And there's a really interesting correlation between the number of children people have and how secure they feel about the future. If you don't feel secure about the future, you have an extra child because they may look after you when the state doesn't or your pension fails. That's the cover I turned down. <laughs> <laughs> a 
the second edition of this book came out in September of this year, and had I agreed with the publisher about what a wonderful cover that is, I would be joining the 1% now. Um, there, there is a, there's a practical reason to showing that picture. In a, in a way, these young men, I grew up in Oxford, these young men were around in the 1980s in Oxford. In a way, these young men have got the upper hand. We are now one of the most unequal countries in the rich world, and we are on track at the moment, as I will bore you about, because I think it really matters, we're on track to win the global race and to become the most economically unequal of the richest 25 countries in the world. Now, the optimistic bit, somebody's got to be the most unequal of the richest 25 countries in the world. Or the other optimistic bit, there's only one way you can go when you're number one. Okay? And in fact, it's not a silly prediction. If you do find yourself at an extreme, the most likely thing is that you will not be at that extreme in 50 years' time, at the time when we're worrying about our grandchildren. Or you may think, actually, this is a good sign. It's great that we're unequal because it means that people who like wearing pig's heads will govern us and get paid a lot of money for doing it, and those people who think it's bad that they do that will be kept down and will be desperate for work and won't talk about the fact that they're wearing pig's heads and it's a little bit odd. The best off in Britain, the best off 1%, often say that they pay their way. About a third of all income tax is now collected from just this best off 1%. But they don't actually pay the highest proportion of their income in taxes because people who've got much less are paying an enormous amount in VAT and other taxes. So the top 1% aren't actually contributing proportionately more than other people and the only reason they pay so much in income tax is because they pay themselves so much so that they can pay themselves so much in income tax. And the only reason we can't charge more income tax to other people is that we pay other people so little you couldn't actually tax them because they couldn't eat if you did that. The newspaper headlines this morning, well at least in the Independent and the Mirror, were that one in four People who were in work were below the living wage now in this country. This is quite stunning to have got to this point. The great news, if we're going to be optimistic again, is that if you believe George Osborne, nobody in two years' time will actually be in that category. We'll have his particular living wage, not quite as much as the actual living wage, but much better than what people are on at the moment. And the government, a Conservative government, will be controlling the incomes of possibly up to a fifth of the population. I mean, it's almost communist. It is quite, if you step back and think about it, it is quite incredible to think what has happened in a few years' time. We've gone from every single Conservative MP opposing the minimum wage to a Conservative Chancellor of the Exchequer introducing a minimum wage at a very high level. If you think things can't change, um, you've really got to think how much has changed in the last 10 years and how much could change. Right, you need to focus on this point. You ready? <coughs> That's 1936. And in a way, when it comes to inequalities between us, the graph is the take of the 1% as a proportion of all income in the country. When it comes to inequalities between us, we are back to 1936. Now, of course, many, many things are much better than 1936. For a start, we're not facing a very likely war in three years' time. Basic levels of living standards are much higher. We don't have the kind of mass middle-aged unemployment that they had in 1936. But the gaps of respect between us, how much you pay people is how much you respect them, what you think they're worth. The gap in how much we respect each other has gone back to that period. The top line is before tax, the bottom line is after tax. Every country in the world, a hundred years ago, in the rich world, was incredibly unequal. They were all very similar to Britain. It's Downton Abbey time. Okay, a few people had 
20% of all the income. They had servants, they had big houses, and the rest had to work out how to survive on the remaining 80% of income for 99% of us. The cost of the First World War was so high, and the only people who could pay that cost were the rich, that that, coupled with the Russian Revolution, coupled with trade unions getting more powerful, resulted in a fall in inequality so that it had halved by around 1936 and then halved again to the 1970s. So when we got to the 1970s, the best off 1% of people, who at that time were head teachers, doctors, university vice-chancellors, they've managed to stay in the 1%. Um, not many bankers. Actually, banking was a pretty mundane job. You wouldn't pay them as much as you'd pay a head teacher to be a banker. The 1% were getting 6% of all income, six times average income. Average income, say, 25,000 now, six times is 150. After tax, 4%. That's 100,000 pounds a year. That happened. That happened in this city, and that happened in this country. That's what it was like in the 1970s. People write terrible histories of the 1970s, saying how awful they were. Often these were people whose family had money, because the 1970s were pretty bad if you had money, because there was high inflation, so your money disappeared. If you didn't have any wealth, which most people didn't, salaries went up, wages went up with that. It wasn't that bad. You could do things in the 1970s, like meet somebody, decide you like each other, and get a house in your 20s and start a family. In half of the country, you can no longer do that. You could do things like decide that you didn't like your job. Whatever job it was, whether it was a posh job or a poor job, you could tell your boss to stuff it and go and get another one. We had an unemployment rate in real terms of about 2% from the 50s, 60s and most of the 70s. We had a really good functioning labour market. A market is where both sides actually have some power. That's where markets work. There were lots of problems in the 70s, but we often forget the things that we did have and what we began to lose is that inequality rose relentlessly from 1978, 79 onwards and upwards. Those dots are elections and they make absolutely no difference. You cannot in hindsight see the effect of one political party winning power or the other. What happened was a turn of events around the First World War, an accelerating equality, so you get to a point where a Conservative government tries to outbid a Labour government for how many council houses they can build, a turn of events in the 1970s, accelerating inequality, so you get to a point where a new Labour government introduces student fees, brings a market into healthcare, does all kinds of things that make it look more dynamic than John Major or Margaret Thatcher before it. And so you have this very, very simple pattern or trend to what's happened in the country. And at the very end, the question is, are we at another tipping point? Uh, the after-tax uh, line dips down because of the 45p rate coming in. The common reaction to this is to say, Oh, it's globalisation, it's a search for talent, it's happening everywhere, it's regrettable but inevitable, let's try and look after the people at the bottom, let's give them £9.20 an hour but take away all their tax credits and so on, and we can't give them much more than that, but let's not stop the 1% taking as much because we need them, they create the wealth, they employ us, they are the future. And if you curtail natural market forces, things will go badly wrong. And the question you have to ask is, if that's true, why haven't they gone badly wrong in so many other places where they have curtailed the excess of the 1%? Uh, this was a photograph taken in Oxfordshire recently at a UKIP rally uh, by one of my friends. Uh, it's a picture that makes me quite happy which may seem odd. I do wonder what that little boy or little girl thinks at the end. But, as I said, lots of things have changed recently, which if you think about how little changed from
from that period from the late 70s to the 90s is interesting. Uh, UKIP is a normal right-wing party. That's what European countries have. They have a far-right party that doesn't particularly like immigration and foreigners and thinks you can do things in a different way. And if only you are nationalistic enough, it'll all be okay. Um, you might see UKIP as a great threat, but I just see it as becoming more European. It's normal to have that kind of a party. And it's much better than the BNP and much, much better than the National Front that we had in the 1970s. The Greens rising is a sign of something new. Okay, they only got one seat, but they got a lot of votes. And again, that's a normal European thing to do, to have a Green Party. A decent European country has at least two Green Parties, or three, that don't get on with each other. Uh, we haven't got there yet. We will. It, it'll take some time. Um, what's happened to the Labour Party over the summer? It's become more European. What do your large mass left-wing socialist European parties do? What do they believe in? What do they say? What hasn't our Labour Party been doing for two decades? It hasn't actually been a Labour Party. It's not a revolution. It is simply becoming a normal mass, slightly boring, left-wing party. The only thing that is strange, and I haven't got the map to show you, it's, is that we are lacking a Conservative Party in the country. Um, so if any of you want a political mission, let's do... We do have a party that call themselves the Conservatives, but they ally themselves with a block of strange parties in Europe who are to the right of the European Conservatives. The European Conservatives are the biggest block in Europe, and we just don't, don't have one. And if we're being optimistic, you have to think about the other changes. You just think... I think you are at least 70% female. That's an incredible change that's happened in my lifetime. I don't think you are 70% female because women particularly want to come and hear me speak. I think you are 70% female because you are representative of the people who are likely to come to a lecture like this in the university campus like this. Uh, for the last 10 years I've been teaching classes of 75% women because that's the number who've got into Sheffield. I had to go to Oxford to teach 50% of men again, uh, but I won't say. But actually, slightly less than 50%, even in geography in Oxford. Or, if you want to be more optimistic, think of the change that's occurred with what happens if you're gay. Going from teachers being told they can't even mention the possibility that somebody is gay, to, was it a gay vicar being voted into the general synod today? I think that's the latest one I heard. Um, Rapid changes happen quite often. Or another one, um, which I, I think we should concentrate on more. When I was a child, it was absolutely normal, in fact it was seen as responsible, to beat children at school if they badly behaved with a cane. We then abolished that in state schools, and a bit later, because they're paying extra, we abolished it in private schools. Um, can you imagine somebody even... I haven't heard anybody in the last two years make the case for corporal punishment. I haven't heard any... Not one person make the case now for very, very obvious reasons. Change really can happen quite quickly. But bad news. And I'm going to start going quickly through this because I do want to hear what you have to say. Some things are getting rapidly, or possibly rapidly worse. In London, there's a 1% rise every year in the size of the private rented sector. The private rented sector uh, is incredibly unfair because you have minimal rights as a private tenant. The rent in the south is twice what a mortgage would be on the same property. Somebody is milking you. Landlords have doubled. Well, they've increased their wealth by 400, 500 billion, I think, in the last four years. Um, it, these are years of not having much wealth. We're getting the tadpole philosophy coming back that Tawney made famous in the 1930s. Tawney was the social scientist who talked about rights and responsibilities. What he meant was the rights of the poor and the responsibilities of the rich. Tony Blair managed to get it the other way round. He actually misquoted him. Um, the tadpole philosophy is the idea that you have a frog sitting on a rock, 
you're all tadpoles and I tell you if you just try hard enough when your little legs begin to grow you too can clamber on this rock and be on the top and if you think about tadpoles in the pond and the rock you'll see the obvious reason why they can't all get on to the rock um, we're beginning to see people talk about that again this is my worst graph <laughs> I have, particularly if you're red green color blind um, I'm afraid now's the time you will know you are red green color blind <laughs> if you can see nothing there um, it is uh, data from 1983 to 2012 along the top so the column above me is 2012 along the side is age there are 90 year olds at the bottom red means majority renting and all you need to see is there's a green stripe going through that is the home owning generation the red dying out there is the end of private renting from the past and the selling off of council houses and so on and, and the new red coming in is the new renting generation so if you're going to worry about the grandchildren the way we are heading we're heading back to 90% of people will pay a rent to a landlord who won't do very much to do at the house because you don't need to and they can be kicked out with just a couple of months notice it sounds terrible but all you've got to do is change the law all you've actually got to do is to get some rights as tenants and then you can be like Germany and have half your population renting but your landlord has to buy you out of your tenancy right? the houses all exist often when we talk about things like housing in Britain and, and how terrible it is it sounds like we're talking about the effect of the Luftwaffe just having come over and bombed our houses or there's been a tsunami or an earthquake and we've lost our housing it's all there okay it's got a bit shabby recently because private landlords aren't very good at looking after housing but it's solvable and if you want to know where to look about how to get decent rights as tenants just look east east northeast pick a country any country and see what they do in those countries in, in the rest of mainland Europe to control people not treating people very well because we don't do things like that because we don't look after each other that well apart from in our health service and even that is crumbling we are not used or we've become not used to the idea that you do need to have some collective ways of offering protection to each other so that that individualistic person doesn't take more and more we have an increasingly individualistic outlook on life it just says if you work hard enough you'll be okay take out that massive student debt it'll be fine because you're going to be earning so much in the future and we don't look to the country which did it before us and we look at the size of the debt bubble in the USA and say actually that didn't work we present people who suggest that the way we're going is not good as somehow being loonies off on some spectrum over there or at least we did but that's beginning to go I mean, you can't win that peace prize in economics now unless you're a left-wing economist you know it's not the first one well, there is signs of a change in, in what is happening housing and I, I'm going to show you some bubble graphs and I'll cut down on the graphs you this is the work of Helen of Becky Pumstall uh, from the University of York this top line is data from every census from 1911 through to the last census and it's how many more rooms the best off temp for people have per person compared to the worst off temp for people back in 1911 the best off had, had four more rooms per person than the worst off which meant that the worst off were actually living four to a room a family to a room essentially inequality increased in 1921 then we built lots of houses and we allocated housing more and more fairly using the very simple mechanism of not letting rich people have all the money you know, that's making sure that salaries at the bottom went up uh, we also built you know housing and allocated it on point systems so the heady days of utopia of having an inequality of three times more rooms per, be per person for the best off and the worst off and then look at 2001 and 2011 huge increases in the inefficiency in which we're using our housing 
We have so many bedrooms, even in London, that everybody could sleep on their own, not share a bed with anybody else. And there would be enough. Not even using the hotels. We built, I think it's about 11 million bedrooms in the last 10 years. We haven't built that many houses, but we've built a lot more rooms. We do need to build some rooms. We do need to build some actual housing and flats, and we need to build it because more people are coming. But that's the only reason we actually need to build. We do need to worry about the people who've got the very most. There's more inequality within the 1% than there is in the other 99% of society. Do not go away thinking that there is this group who meet on yachts and are the 1% and plan things very, very carefully and know what they're doing. At the bottom of the 1% is a young banker on £160,000 who's just been refused a mortgage on a free bed house in Hammersmith. Actually, in the 1%, when you poll people, you find that there are people in the bottom of the 1% who think they don't have enough because they can't survive. That's the bottom. The middle, the median income is about £300,000 for a family in the 1%. But this lot, this lot are in the Sunday Times rich list. And this particular 10 are the richest families in London on that list. And they've got over a quarter of all the wealth of the richest families in London. There's another 490 families left in the blue area around there. So it's very easy to be in the Sunday Times rich list and not think you're that rich. You just have to look above you in the list. It's an incredible uh, curve. It's an incredible inequality within the top of the 1%. But the problem is, why we have to worry about this, is that this group of people have doubled their wealth since the recession. If that carries on, you become facils. It's just no, it won't carry on, it just can't carry on, but if it carries on, you go back to a kind of Downton Abbey future. Uh, there are scary worldwide statistics on this. The richest 1% have over half the world's wealth, and last year increased it by seven percentage points in one year. That carries on for seven more years, the richest 1% own everything on the planet. What that tells you is that something really strange and unusual usual, and completely unsustainable is happening right now. I, I can give you another statistic of these kind of ones that, that tell you that now really is interesting in a way that it hasn't been that interesting for many, many years. Life expectancy in Kensington, Chelsea, and Westminster has been going up by more than a year a year. You know, from 87.5 for women to 89 in one year, from 89 to 91.5. Again, it's one of those statistics that tells you that you're living in very unusual times. Because the only alternative is that Kensington and Chelsea becomes Mount Olympus, and they live forever. Do you see? I, I know I'm nerdy and I like these numbers, but, but the numbers are so extreme that they're telling you that you're living in a period where something very strange has happened, almost by mistake. A quarter of families in England are now private renting. Right? It was about less than 10% in 2005. Um, nobody planned for this to happen this quickly. They wanted young professionals, other people to rent privately. You don't want a quarter of families with children to be renting privately because people get very angry because children like their friends and when they go to school they want to stay at that school and they don't want to have to move schools every time the landlord decides to put the rent up and move them around. The scope for upset is very, very high. Evictions doubled in London last year. In England as a whole, deaths from overdoses of drugs went up 40% last year. It's not a good time, but it is an unusual time. Um, it is not happening everywhere and we are strange. This is us. So I showed you the curve before. This is different data. But here we are. Down in the 1970s, 1% 1 taking 6% of all income. We were the second most equitable large country in Europe in the 1970s. Sweden beat us. But we were practically Scandinavian. And then we jump over country after country after country. And there we are with the 1% taking around about 15% now. We are a really interesting natural experiment. 
if you want to see what happens if you dramatically increase inequality. We don't think we're strange because we compare ourselves to the United States. But as I'll show you as I get to the end, the United States is very, very strange. Netherlands. If you want a country to compare ourselves to, look at the Netherlands. If you don't think it's possible for the 1% to have less, um, you've got to ask yourselves, well, how do the Dutch manage to do it? Okay, one table for you. This is the ratio calculated about five years ago between the income of the best off tenth of society and the worst off tenth of society for what were then the 25 richest countries of the world with at least two million people. Right, so I'm not trying to fix these things. Japan was the most equal country in the world. The Scandinavian countries neatly lined up next to each other. Then Germany, Austria, Slovenia, South Korea, Denmark, Belgium, Switzerland. Swiss bankers take a pay rate which is half what our bankers take. Go up. Switzerland, France, Netherlands, Iceland, Canada, Greece, Spain, Italy, New Zealand, Australia and Israel. So we're getting near the top of the inequality league. Israel is a very unequal country. <coughs> and then you get to us, where the best off tenth are taking almost 14 times more income a year than the worst off tenth, only because of the 1%. It's the 1%'s income that's dragging that group up. Portugal's now dropped out of this group because when your housing falls in value by half, it's the housing of the rich which loses out, the poor are renting in Portugal. The United States being more unequal than Singapore. We can talk about Singapore later if you want to talk about what it might be like in Britain if we were to become more unequal. This table's too small, it just shows you I've tried to update these figures. Uh, these are the figures from this year, the latest figures you can get, the data's not brilliant. And there's lots of small print, which I'll leave up for 30 seconds if you're interested. It's quite interesting that the pigs have fallen out and some oil states have, have fallen into 25 richest countries. But essentially, if you're worried about the top of the table, then what's been happening is that Obama has actually managed to increase taxes on the rich. Singapore has brought in a series of laws to stop capital flight so the Chinese don't buy their flats and leave them empty in Singapore. We haven't done anything like that. In fact, we've dropped corporation tax from 28% to 20% and we wanted to get down to 18%. And we've told people your property is safe if you buy in London. And so if you take the old figures from five years ago and the figures from now and project forward, then by 2030 we will become the most unequal country on the planet. Um, we've kind of been here before. You remember I showed you 1936 at the beginning? And in 1936, people drew cartoons like this, trying to explain the problem of austerity. That it has a far worse problem at the person at the, for the person at the bottom, who's going to drown, than the man at the top, than the £10,000 a year man. The difference now, and a really interesting difference, the biggest change in 100 years in what happens is that all these men and women now have stepped down, but the man at the top's actually stepped up the ladder. Um, and that is very strange, and I think that shows it's not planned. The incomes of the 1% the take has actually risen. The wealth has certainly risen. Right. Okay, public spending, and you can guess where this is going, so I won't spend any time. Uh, you might remember the Chancellor saying that we were a high tax and spend economy. He said that in the budget. Do you remember that? It's only May. High tax and spend economy. I think he actually believes that. I, I don't think he knows this. Right? I, I do. Um, at the end of that budget speech, he had a little line which was an ad lib, which isn't in the transcript, which said something along the lines of, it was the Conservatives who stopped children having to work in the mills. It was the Conservatives who brought us free education. It was the Conservatives who brought in votes for women. It was the Conservatives who gave you right to buy on housing, which actually was true. It was technically true. So, of course, the Conservatives have always been the party of working people in Britain. He, he 
put in that ad lib because I think he absolutely believed it. That was whoever taught him history at university that taught him that. And whoever taught him history at university, I don't know where he went, whoever taught him history hadn't told him about percentages. Um, <laughs> Finland, Denmark, France, Italy, Belgium, Austria, Sweden, Norway, Slovenia, all tax and spend more. This is the proportion of GDP spent on public spending in 2015. This is what the IMF say it will be in 2019, given current government budgets. Then you get down to Luxembourg, Netherlands, Portugal, Iceland, Greece, and Malta. We're getting below 35 now. And finally, where are we? We're here. High tax and spend country. Um, and that's our reduction. We are going to be spending more than the Slovak Republic and Ireland um, and San Marino. Now, you don't have to tax and spend highly to be a good country. Uh, Japan is, and I haven't got Japan on this graph because the data doesn't include Japan. Japan taxes and spends less. But remember, Japan is the most equal of 25 countries. When people each have enough, the state doesn't have to bail out those at the bottom. It, you, know, you can provide many more things without having to use the state. Why do we have high inequality? It's not our fault. We were not on the losing side of a war for a long time. The reason why Germany and Japan look so good is because they had equality imposed upon them when they lost the war. There are people who argue that inequality is good. You should just give everybody a fair pop. But you want the tall poppies to rise to the top and that'll be great. Those people won the argument in this country in the 1970s. There were another group in the 1970s who didn't argue enough because nobody told them that actually it's worth arguing now. Um, things need to change. There are reasons such as racism. The levels of inequality are only sustainable in the United States because one part of the population doesn't see another part of the population essentially as human. We have class barriers in this country which were very high and are re-emerging again. We're ever so sensitive about it, but they are there. Every time I've said a word, you have made a judgment upon me naturally about what kind of an accent I have and where I come from and what that might say. When we look at each other's clothing, it's a lecture in itself. I, th I think it's fascinating. And again, a brilliant natural experiment. You know, we have opened ourselves up for the world sociologists to come and study what happens to people when you put this gap between them. Do they look each other in the eye anymore? Or do some people look down at the shoes and other people look over at other people's shoulder? In most of the world, inequality is due to poverty. Most countries in the world are more unequal than these riches 25. Greater equality is something you get and win with economic growth. And the other reason, I think, maybe the most important reason why we have such high rates of inequality is that we're not aware of it being a problem. as a kind of so what problem. Now there are loads of correlations. They are pretty dodgy, so I'm going to go through them fast. I'm not making a great case here. But, but if, if you were worried about the planet burning up, you know, and there was a connection between being an unequal country, having twice the advertising spend of a normal rich country, and buying more McDonald's, it might matter. Uh, and these are huge differences in the amount of meat people eat. Of course, some countries, people eat meat because there's lots of meat around in New Zealand. Water consumption is similar. Gasoline, and again, the US is very, very strange. So if you take that away, not much of a relationship. Um, infant mortality rates. There are lots and lots of things you can look at where you begin to see these relationships, but I suspect the ones that will really matter will be consumption. You essentially need four planets if everybody behaves like they behave in the United States. You only need two if they behave like they behave in Japan. Now, we haven't got two, right? So you can't even do, do that, but it's a very big uh, difference in behavior. There have been a huge number of studies that show what happens when you become more unequal. And we need to take account of these because we are used to how we are. 
We think this is normal because how we're living now is normal. But we're living with a, a lot less trust than most people in most rich countries have for each other. We don't understand each other as much as it is normal to understand each other because we're living parallel lives between different wealth and income groups. We learn less. I'll show you an example of, of this, but I've looked at it for three things now. When we compete more, and you have to compete more because the stakes are higher, you actually learn less. Exam results become more and more important. Lots of testing, lots of exams. You have to get an A-star, A-star AA, get into the right university, get the 2-1. If you're lucky, you'll get the average paid job. Get the average paid job, and then you can pay back £70,000 on your student loan. Get slightly more, you can pay 150000 But of course, if mum and dad were rich enough that they could pay the nine grand up front, oh, no student loan. Why didn't we notice that? Why didn't we notice that there is a small group of people who can afford to pay £27,000 who this have this interest? <sighs> okay, let's take maths. Let's do a quick one. Survey just to wake you up. I really am very near the edge of this lecture because I am over, I'm testing your patience, so I'm going to insult you now. Um, oh, that's, who got an A star at GCSE maths? There we are, the youngsters. Interestingly, if you get an A star at maths, you choose to sit in the middle of the lecture theatre. Okay. Um, who, who got an A? A at GCSE or an A at O level? Yep, some oldies. It's my year. Uh, B's, great, C's, it's okay, uh, D or below, a few of you, see not, it's great, well done for coming forward, should have been about 40% of you if we're going to be representative, so you can already see how unrepresentative we are, uh, all this. so let's just have a look at you, this is uh, international test in maths ability for these countries, these are the unequal ones, this means you're good at maths, and we're not that good at maths. But we give ourselves A stars and A's, but we're not that good. We should, we really ought to get rid of the A star and A, and the top mark should be a B until we get better. That would be, um, maybe that's what the new one to nine's about. But we're better than the United States, okay? So look, there's a nice correlation, not very strong, an exception like Singapore. You know, some more equal countries, they seem to learn and do maths better. But, and here's the crux, this is ability at maths at age 15. This is how good you are as a maths test at the point you're going to get the key maths test of your life. Most people do maths tests at 15, 16, they never do it again. Hate it. Who did maths A level? Oh, you're weird. Okay, but you're my knowledge. Who didn't do maths A level? Right. Who doesn't like maths? Okay. <laughs> right. Don't like life, maths. This is a test at age 15 or 16 at maths ability. This is a test to age, up to age 24. What we are good at, or well not that good at, but at least not prophetic at, what the United States can do is train people to do okay in a maths test of one day. But we don't actually teach people maths. And the way we can tell that is by testing them later on as young adults and finding that they're appalling at it. Whereas these countries, which were doing a bit better then, They've remembered it. So what's going on? And if this is, and I can tell you now, the same thing for literacy, the same for problem solving. It's really worrying. Of course, we don't have a university system that's entirely geared when you're taking some exams at the end of your third year, you get just a mark and that's all that matters and you can forget about it afterwards. That's, you know, we have a nice learning environment at universities where exams are not that important and, and so on. But this is really worrying and it's worrying for our grandchildren, if we have managed to get ourselves an education system which is not actually teaching us how to enjoy learning so that we're good at it, it's very, very bad news. And that's why we should worry about inequality. Because it's damaging all of us, and it damages people at the top. Our cleverest people are not that clever when you compare them to other clever people in more equal countries. Which is why so many of our PhD students and researchers and university lecturers are not from England anymore. You know, we've got to wake up and spot this. We tell ourselves it's because we're globally brilliant at higher education, so we're attracting them. But a last bubble graph, and it's not that one causes the other. 
People in the United States did not w wake up one morning and go, hey, we're the most unequal country in the world, I'm going to drive to work. Right? <laughs> didn't. But, but, but only 3.5% of people in the United States walk or cycle to work. Whereas the Netherlands up there, 50%. The reason you get a strong correlation for something like this is because you cannot build housing yourself so that it's near where you work. You cannot paint cycle lanes yourself. You have to be in a country that decides that it's going to have a good public transport system. It's going to make space for bikes. It's going to stop children dying on the roads, which is what they did in the Netherlands in the 1970s. And you can't do that individually. If you're individualistic, if you just say, let everybody get on and do it themselves, you end up with urban sprawl, you end up with people sitting in traffic jams, and you end up with the most amazing correlations. If you worry about correlation and causation of these things, you know, what is it that makes the Americans eat so much meat? Is it because they're trying to get fat? Or are they getting fat because they're sitting in cars so long every day? And are they sitting in the cars because they don't trust each other? Or is it... All these things correlate with each other. But what you can say about Americans is they're not very good at organising themselves. They are more individualistic. To the point, a few years ago, where a mayor in a town in Texas opposed the building of pavements because pavements were the beginning of the road to socialism. <laughs> he actually said it. Right. But, and here's the worrying thing. We can laugh about Americans and apologies to Americans. They're always very liberal Americans when they end up in Britain. Maybe that's why they end up in Britain. But just think what people in more normal countries say about us. It's actually quite scary. You know, what do they laugh about? We're not funny. We don't do anything strange. We don't buy lots of clothes and throw them away and our, all our shopping malls are full of clothes shops of clothes we don't really need. Or we ha Try and have a guess what people in an average rich country think about us and our wonderful education system, say. The last graph. You can get carried away with these graphs. Um, there's a lovely similar one for actually age of giving, giving birth to children. This is the segregation index of the Conservative Party. So supposing you're worried about Conservative voters and you think that they might be segregating and they're not really joining in with everybody else, uh, you calculate a segregation index. The segregation index is what proportion of Conservative voters would you have to move, the minimal proportion, to get an even number in every constituency, the same share everywhere. So this has nothing to do with winning or losing elections. This is simply about how concentrated geographically are Conservative voters at elections, each dot's an election. They were very concentrated when we were very unequal. It wasn't just related to inequality, there were religious divides. That inequality came down, it was very low. You have Conservatives everywhere. You could kind of walk out down your street and find one, have a chat and you could have an argument, if you were like me. Um, <laughs> Then there was a great big spike in February 1970, no, in October 1974. The southeast of England swung to the Conservatives. Not enough for them to win the election, but it was the beginning. Drops back to 79, and then every election since 1979, the segregation index of Conservative voters rises and rises and rises. So I live in a Labour constituency of Oxford East, and I can't find a single Conservative voter on my street because we're 50% Labour voting. That's 50% of the electorate voting Labour. There are hardly any Conservatives in Oxford East. Right? If you're not Labour, you're Green. If you're not Green, you don't vote. The next most likely thing is Liberal. But if I go 10 miles out in any direction, the only people I can find, I know they voted Conservative, because I don't think somebody's fixed the election result. So, so we've segregated. We've actually pulled apart in who we meet and who we talk to geographically. Now, the fascinating thing is that we've had this huge increase in segregation in the last election. This has nothing to do with Scotland whatsoever. There haven't been any Conservative voters in Scotland for many, many years. So this rise is all about segregation within England. Um, it should normally mean it's very hard for you to win an election. But the last election was fascinating. Only 25% of the electorate voted for the party that won the majority of seats. Until now, I've been saying that there's been no other country in the world where just one in four 
of the electorate have managed to vote in a majority government. Even in the States, the president gets more votes than that. However, I got an email on the train up here, and in Colombia, in Colombia, it is possible to get hold of the country with just 19% of the electorate. Right, so we are still more democratic than Colombia, but that is the only one. Uh, and again, tipping point there, tipping point there, tipping point there, something completely different than what the 1% take. For me, it's too much constituent, too much coincidence. Doesn't mean one causes the other, but it's not unrelated. This is data that the ONS pulled about two years ago because they had underestimated this bar. They weren't sure of that bar. And that's the kind of angry graphic you used to get in the 1980s about inequality. And it just shows how the thing has risen. OK, the worrying thing. I honestly think we're at a tipping point for all kinds of reasons, because it just it's not in the interest of the vast, vast majority of people, 99.5% of people, for this to carry on. And I think things that George Osborne are doing, changing the rules on landlords, bringing in capital gains tax on non-doms for me this year. Lots of very small, subtle things. But I think you begin to see the change. My worry is that there is a small group who argue for greater inequality, and they're no longer arguing for it worldwide. And they're no longer arguing for trickle-down worldwide. They're saying, you know, we know it doesn't work worldwide, but you could have it in one country. One country could become the place of attraction to the richest people in the world. One country could get the highest number of billionaires per head living there. All that money coming in will create jobs for other people. Admittedly, chauffeuring and cleaning jobs and so on. We could educate the children of the richest of the world in our schools and our universities. We could do this. And we could leave Europe and we could have guest workers coming to change the beds in the hotels. And the great thing about guest workers is that they can't have children. If they have a child, you send them out again. That's my only nightmare. And I just don't see how we're so supine that we are going to go, OK, we like Downton Abbey, you know, let's head back to that. You can't send 50% of young women to university in Britain and tell them that for them and their children and their grandchildren, being servile is going to be the future. I do think we're on the edge of change, but the edge of change is always painful. The First World War period was painful. If you had said in 1913 or 1916 what would have been achieved over the next few decades, people would have said you're mad. What do you mean pensions? What do you mean insurance? What do you mean a free health service? You're completely out of it. And if you'd done the same in the 1970s, if you'd said, oh, well, the trade unions will practically disappear, we'll be charging people to go to university as an amount of money that most of them will never manage to pay back. I could go through the list of things that people wouldn't imagine possible, and they happened. So given that's happened twice before, the sensible thing is to say, Lots of things are very likely to happen in the next 40 or 50 years that we're going to find very hard to imagine right now. But if we want a guide to it, we should look at what has happened in other places. And we should understand that when you are this weird, the most likely thing is you're going to become less weird, particularly if it's in the interest of the vast majority of you. Please tell me where I'm going wrong. Thank you. My accent's a dead giveaway. <laughs> I'm wearier than you, I think. <laughs> so thank you. That was fascinating. Um, we have time for some questions. We have folks with microphones. Uh, so we've got one over here, young man here in the front. Hi. Uh, um, sorry, firstly, just to introduce myself, I'm Henry, and I'm a second year undergraduate student. Um, and I agree with a lot, a lot of what you said. Um, and I'm thinking of writing my dissertation about this. Um, before I start speaking, uh, my mum was a clinical psychologist, worked in the NHS, and she worked really hard to send me to a private school. So I uh, <laughs> hope that's not a point of contention. 
But um, do you not think that we are harking back to 1936 because of the Wall Street crash in 1929 and now in 2015? And furthermore, um, comparing now, like then, to, to now, um, the difference between then and now is technology. For example, uh, take the Economist reader from last week, uh, discusses genetic engineering as a way of um, in touching distance, curing malaria, and dengue, dengue, which would bring the world $2 trillion in GDP. Um, do you believe in, G in technology, or do you take this far left, unoptimistic, unoriginal, similar to spirit level and capitalism in the 21st century approach to sell more books? Okay. <laughs> so, the, I mean, one thing is that you do sell an awful lot of books if this is what you do at the moment. So much so that, that right wing publishers have now begun to give up publishing the Adam Smith Institute and the Institute of Economic Affairs. You can't sell a right wing economics book now, um, which again is another sign of, of change. Um, 1929 is interesting. When 1929 hit, for four or five years, the powers that be tried simply to return to 1928. That was the plan. It took that long before they realised they had to do a new deal and we weren't going to return. But even then, that generation of men who were in charge never quite accepted that they'd made a mistake because men don't do that. What happened was that the generation beneath them, people who were university students in 1929 and 1935, they decided that their parents' generation had got it entirely wrong. Not least because their parents went and sent them to war, having already had one world war. And it was that generation who then brought in that great increase in equality, free education, going you know, to the nearest school rather than worrying about whether you went to a private school, which is a change again. Technology is really, really interesting. We've, we've, we have had technological changes since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. It's just a continuous technological change. Uh, the, the brilliant thing about what's happening now with technology is if you look at the amount of consumption we have, we are buying much less by weight. If you think about children's toys and about Christmas 10 years ago, the amount of crap kids used to get 10 years ago, now they just want a screen. And we agonise about the fact they've got a screen. But they can get another game and another game and another game without actually needing to buy another lump of plastic and ship it all the way around from China. You just have, have one. Uh, so the scope for economic growth, uh, which is weightless, is incredibly high. And weightless economic growth, that is not consuming more carbon but growing and having a better life, is very, very good news. Uh, one thing I, I do, one terrible problem with the left uh, is pessimism. And then at the moment, a lack of imagination. So what the left tends to do is to say, why can't we have council houses again? Why can't we have comprehensive schooling like we had it? Why can't we? And it's all about going back to things which were brilliant solutions in the 30s, we got them by the 70s. But it isn't looking forward to what people might want now. And so you do need to look forward, you need to come up with new things, a new imagination uh, for what you've got. But, I mean, the biggest one on technology is we are very close to the $100 computer. And when you get the $100 computer, that means that over half the world's children will have access to the internet. Uh, to get the $100 computer, silicon wafers, which are kind of this big, it's what they punch the chips out of, they need to make them this big. There are only a couple of factories in the world that make these silicon wafers, and they're currently on the edge of deciding whether economically it makes sense for them to change it so they can have the $100 computer. And what are they looking at when they do their models? They're looking at the future forecast of inequality, because if the world is unequal, it is not worth their while producing the $100 computer because there would be too many children who can't afford $100. But if the world becomes more equal, their market gets big enough, and we will do this. It's, we are on the edge of very good things potentially happening. Yeah, just here. Why hasn't there been a revolution? <laughs> we, don't, we don't do revolution in this country. You know, we're so bad at it, we decided to call a king coming over, you know, the sea and all, you know, glorious revolution that wasn't one. Um, there, are, there are correlations with, with uh, uprisings and disturbances, and they certainly increase when things get worse. So that there's been papers by economists showing that that increases. 
but we get used to it. You know, this is a frog in the kettle thing. Um, why on earth should you think this is strange? If you're one of those people who got an A star, why is it strange to be examined every year at school and given numbers like 6C and 5B? You know, and given lots of homework. You can't remember that. That's just what happens to people. So you don't get a revolution because it's gradual. Rev revolutions are few and far between and they're not, they're not always successful. What I think you want to look at is how do you begin to change things such that the change becomes self-reinforcing? Um, so I, I can give you a strange, well not a strange example, but house prices. Supposing they've peaked in the south of England now. They are the highest in the world in London, so they may have peaked. What if they were to fall 1% a year for the next 50 years to get down to a normal level of house price? It's the equivalent of every trade union winning its pay increase for all its members every year and for everybody else who has to pay for housing. But we don't see a gradual reduction of housing prices to a normal rate as being something even good. So when one reason why we haven't got a revolution is because we've yet to get beyond the idea of it's really good if house prices are really expensive. You know, I think it's not going to be hard to get there. The other thing that's happening very rapidly is we've only got the first three or four years of students who paid full fees. Uh, I think the third year has entered the labour market this year. They're going to start trying to pay back. Next year we get another year. Next year another year. By the election we've got five years of graduates paying back their 27,000 out there and there were three in universities. Right, this cohort that are going to come through who made the mistake of being born a bit too late, um, <laughs> that, you know, are they really going to sit there and go fair cop? You know, of course I'm going to rent for the rest of my life and have insecure contracts. You know, who wants to start a family anyway? And that's why I think you're, you're looking at something which is not sustainable partly because the upper middle class do so badly out of this. You know, so I haven't been talking about people at the bottom of society or even people in the middle of society. I'm t mainly talking about the problems of people in the top 10% of society. And when the top 10% are not doing well, you, know, you can't run a country without the support of the top 10%. You can't just run it on benefiting some of the 1% and telling the next 10% don't worry, you've got a chance of joining us. People are not that slow. We have the haves, which are 1%, the maybe-haves, which are 9%, and the have-nots, which are 90%. And as soon as the maybe-haves begin to work out that only their most greedy child will be okay, and their other children and grandchildren won't, I think that's when you begin to see a change. We have a question here. I think one of the problems is that the, one of the central institutions in the reproduction of inequality is now the university. So what you describe as unsustainable is the university itself. And yet we don't respond within the university to, the, to these uh, arguments. We confront students who are increasingly indebted the Academy of Social Sciences made a contribution, uh, you know, campaign for more funding for social science, published a report about why it was valuable to the country, didn't mention inequality in one sentence in the entire report. So in a sense, we are part of the, the problem. And the real risk, or my sort of, would like your... Uh, pose this now as a question rather than a rant, but the interesting <laughs> thing is that if 40% of students don't pay back their fees, 60% of students will, and they will also be paying back their fees and asked to pay the taxes to support the 40% who don't. Mm. That's not a recipe for solidarity, that's a recipe for arguing uh, against a generous loan system and so on. One already sees that unfolding and it's part of the unfolding in America. And so what I find difficult to understand is where, how one answers the question, could we be so supine when we are in fact in the most supine institution yes. in the country? 
We, it makes sense. I mean, be honest, the only reason we are here is because we were pretty supine. You know, but somebody was going to be. We, we also, if you want to know, if you are one of these students paying fees, what actually happened around about 2010, the choice we were implicitly given was to have what has happened to government departments happen to us, which in some cases is one in two people being sacked, or have what happened to the police, which is one in five, or the army. Or if we just keep quiet and accept £9,000 rather than £3,000, we don't have to look right and left and decide which of the three of us is going to go in the next year. That is what, that's why academics didn't protest. Because if you were protesting against the fees, you were basically calling for the sacking of your colleagues. And maybe some of us, I didn't, but I think some people might have been so clever as to realise that this thing was unsustainable. It'll be at least 60% you can't pay back. Um, and it's, it's already the government are on about 47% not. Um, if you look at the salaries of 31-year-old graduates, nothing's happened. You basically have to go and do one of five courses in four universities to be able to pay back at the moment, um, which is basically finance and law. So it's not... But you're only talking about half the population. So you're talking about half of half the population may feel that, you know, they've paid their bit and they should be okay. The other 75% haven't benefited. At the moment, however, 75% of the population are not particularly well organised you know, between the splits of parties. But it doesn't, just doesn't make sense. It's not just the student loans. It's, it's the PFI for the healthcare. But the nice thing about the student loan is it's individualised. None of you know what your PFI debt is on the local hospital and how you're going to pay that one back. You know what it is in total, but you haven't shared it out. The student loans individualises this uh, to people. Um, on the academy, they were trying to play a game with a minister of talking about what wonderful things social science could do to help business. Uh, because we're very good at getting in people's minds and trying to get them to buy things they really don't want to buy. And it gets to a tragedy when you're trying to stop ESRC being cut in the, in the spending review on the grounds that we have people who can do an even better job than McDonald's at getting you to recognise those twin arches. Um, but it's desperate times. Um, the ESRC, the, the Economic and Social Research Council, appears in a chapter of a book written by a Conservative MP halfway through on Quangos he would cut. And they've cut them all up to that point. Um, so, you, you know, it's not good, but it shouldn't be good. If it was good and enjoyable with this level of inequality, then there wouldn't be a problem. But it isn't, which is why you need to say isn't enough is enough, and it isn't going to help us allowing a few wealth creators to get wealthier and wealthier. It really hasn't worked. We've tried the experiment. We've given it a shot. In theory, on paper, maybe it might have worked in the 70s, but we've actually done it now. In the back, there's a question. I've got a big, boomy voice anyway. So. <laughs> I don't, anyhow. Thank you. Um, I'm, I, I loved your optimism, especially at this time of the evening. Um, but I wondered if your optimism about political change is really, really justified by what you said. I mean, the reasons you seem to have for change are that the party system is becoming more European. Uh, George Osborne's turning out to be a kind of closet social democrat. And things are so screwed up it can't go on this way. But, I mean, it's been screwed up for about 30 or 40 years and it's just carried on. Um, I don't... I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about where you think the political clout, because... One of the reasons this happens is it's in some people's interests. Yeah. It, it is. That there is a group who really, really believe that our high level of inequality is a measure of how well we've done. Because we've managed to sort out the useless people, which is the majority of the population, and, and not waste money on them. And we've identified, through numerous mechanisms, you know, people's amazing genes, meaning that they, I won't annoy you, but anyway, we've identified the truly gifted human beings and we're managing to keep them in the country. So we pay 2,200 bankers more than a million euros a year. Uh, the next country in Europe only pays 197 bankers that much. 
So in fact, there aren't any jobs for them to go to. But there are a group who do, who do argue this. But they're a very small group of people. Um, it's not really their fault. If you believe the work on pro-social and anti-social human beings coming out of Amsterdam, there are a group of people who have very little empathy, um, do think you're on your own, other people will just stab you in the back. You have to do. So when you hear somebody making an individualistic argument passionately, they often really, really believe it, but they are a minority of people. They also have a problem in, in that they're clever enough not to realise you don't say to a group like you, look, the way the world works, even though we're at the University of Nottingham and you've got your degrees and your A stars and Bs and so on, only about 1% of you are actually really able. Only 1% of you could create an amazing manufacturing company and produce a kind of vacuum cleaner that would save us. You know, that's <laughs> come up with, you know, and, and that's what, you know, we, we need to get another vacuum cleaner and that'll do it. And a couple of, you know, they don't, you don't tell people that because they won't believe you. But I, 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 can, I can start to sort of reel off signs of things that are good. They might sound minor. A hundred local authorities at the moment now have 20 mile an hour traffic limits. You know, getting your local traffic down to 20 miles an hour is beginning to accept that you don't let a few selfish people speed at 30 at the rate you kill children. It might sound like a very small achievement. Most of Europe is at 30 kilometers an hour, which is 18.5 miles an hour. But the fact we now have a hundred local authorities that are now controlling cars collectively shows that people are beginning to do uh, things differently. And I don't hear many right-wing academics nowadays. There always were a few mavericks in the 80s and 90s. They've kind of gone pretty quiet. Uh, so I, I, I am generally optimistic. Of course it isn't great. But in a sense, the nice thing about student loans is that they're not repayable. If somebody had brought in a system that was repayable, it would be scarier. But this thing really looks like a dead donkey when you can't sell it onto a hedge fund at the moment. If we'd found a <laughs> subtle way of increasing the private renting so that only the undeserving families were going into it, you could have done that. But this current situation whereby if any of you want to come down and work in my city, unless you've got family money, that's a phrase I haven't heard for a long time, unless you've got family money, you're going to be renting in Oxford. Um, it's, you know, th things are changing that mean that pretty well-off people are worrying about their future and they're particularly worrying about their children's future. And they do whatever they can to help their children, but they begin to worry about their weakest child, not the strong one. And then you worry what will happen to the grandchildren in this society. It's when you start doing that you can, you can begin to say, do we really want a society where we return, you know, the most popular job for women a hundred years ago was to be a servant. So which one of our grandchildren is going to be a servant living in the basement or up in the attic of a house? And if you really don't want that for your grandchildren, then you have to start doing something about it, because that is the direction in which we're heading. You know, it, you've got to say it's that bad to be optimistic. <laughs> I thought, otherwise we will we will head there we will just you know not our forelock say it's all fine and watch the standard of living fall for the majority of the population and the desperate competition and fight for those above increase and watch a few people at the top you know hey they pay by chances a million pounds a year in Australia why don't we do that you know it's not hard to see it getting worse uh, but you've got to be angry enough about it to stop it getting worse. Yeah. I'm angry about it, but I'm also optimistic. An angry optimist. We had a question just here in the middle. Um, <laughs> spoiled for choice. You can have the left wing uh, microphone or the right wing. <laughs> 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 
You are the median order. Is that work? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name's Terry Arnon. I'm a GP. I'm also a county and district councillor in North West Leicestershire. Um, and we're creating a local plan for where we're going to put our houses at the moment. I am um, a uh, district councillor in Colville, where the, it's an ex-mining town. Um, unfortunately, North West Leicestershire is a Tory area. Um, and we have, um, in my area, average income of a family is going to be around 20k. Um, and I've got 800 people sitting on the waiting list for uh, social rented homes. Our strategic housing market assessment said that we need 30 to 40 percent affordable homes, homes in Colville. So we've got a local plan, and we're now um, asking developers to put 5 to 10 percent in. And recently we heard Cameron saying, well, we won't be doing social uh, rent affordable homes. We're going to be doing these new affordable homes, which means they cost 250k, and you get a bit of a discount. Um, so, we, you know, while we're creating our local plan and consulting on that, I'm curious as what you were saying about the, you know, the number of beds per person, and um, also then curious about the what can we do? You know, those of us who are daft enough to be involved in politics, because it feels like I have no power at all. It, it feels like the boring. You know, I've bored you enough with data. You can get the numbers for North West Leicestershire for the number of bedrooms there are and the number of people. You will discover that there are a lot of elderly people, particularly more affluent elderly people, who are living on their own in quite large houses. Often, uh, those people are quite lonely. And when they're surveyed, they say they'd rather live in a smaller property, but nearby, because they don't want to lose their friends. So you need to build some smaller properties for people to downsize to. But the other thing you need to do is have house prices falling. Because one reason people sit in large properties isn't, which they can't heat, is for the benefit of their children and grandchildren, because they can pass on the money. If, and it won't take, you don't have to do much for house prices to fall when they're this high. They do fall every so often. You know, things like giving tenants rights reduces house prices. But the, the best way, if you really want house prices to fall fast, if you want a revolution, just vote no in that European referendum. See what happens to house prices then when you actually stop people coming in it's not very complicated economics. I mean, you don't just stop people coming in. You tell a large number of people in this country, we really don't like you. you know? A large number of highly skilled people in this country, we really don't like you. It's a great way to get house prices down. Anyway, house prices, you want them to begin to fall so that people try to leave housing they don't need that's too large for them, so that families can get into those and they free up space for somebody else. And you need to build stuff. But you build stuff for downsizing for people as well as for people who are trying to start a family as well. And there are loads of ways in which you can build. A third of housing in Germany is self-built. That's not actually somebody building it themselves, because that would be silly. It, <laughs> it's employing a small local builder to build for you. We used to have small local builders. They almost all went bust with the crash in 2008. Those that survived were bought by the big builders. The big builders have a meeting every year with Grant Shapps, or whoever the minister is now, where they all congratulate themselves. So you're right, they do get together. I've sat at that dinner. They're not that clever. Because I'm the house, you know, the house of bloody Mackinder, professor at Oxford, I get invited to sit at these dinners where they do this. But they didn't plan the housing crash in 2008. It isn't a conspiracy planned on a yacht. This is something that has happened, and the fallout of it has been disastrous because nobody had a good plan of how to deal with it. And we've ended up in a disaster. So now you have that and the hundreds of people who actually need to be housed. There are also thousands of people who actually want to build some houses as well. And it, this is not a high-tech industry. You know, we do not lack the skills to build housing, but you need to organise yourselves to do it. And we don't in the past. The, the legislation that allows you to build Milton Keynes is still on the books. You can compulsory purchase land at agricultural price, legally. There's all kinds of things you can do. You just have to have the right people in government. So I don't know what you do. Get your friends to vote some wacky person in. You know, make, make them leader. But, but more seriously, you get the wacky person in, then get the shadow cabinet changed. Then what happens to that particular political party? Then get it talking to the Green Party. That's quite interesting. Work out how you can walk out of four seats and let the Greens have those and they can quietly walk out of the other 646 seats. Get on with the SNP, they're not the devil incarnate. Even talk to the Liberals in the north of England. I mean, after all, if 75% of you have got something in common, what the hell are you doing hating each other that much? Yeah. 
really, I'm only a geographer. I'm not that clever, but it isn't that hard. Okay, we had another question up front here. Yes, sir. He just answered it. Good. We have another one back there. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you. Hello, my name is Matthew. I'm a first year economics student. And you mentioned a, a phenomenon in that in, in, it's quite, a, it's in America, it's always been, but in the UK, salaries for some very high paid employees have skyrocketed, managing directors, bankers. And that hasn't been the case <laughs> in, uh, in Europe. And you mentioned that, that, that London bankers get paid more than Swiss bankers. Yeah. I mean, why is that? Because also that is, that is a very useful argument for people who, support, who argue that inequality isn't a bad thing, is it? London pays so much tax, why should we do anything that might harm that in any way? Yeah. We raise taxes, they'll all disappear, oh no. They will go, yes. Um, so that's a very, there's a very dangerous thing happening there. But well, why does it happen? Why does it happen? It's not, essentially, why somebody says 160... 160,000 is what you need if you're on your own to get into the 1%, in case you're wondering. Okay? If you've got a kid, uh, 200,000. Why does somebody on 160 say that's not enough? Because they can't get a house, a free bed semi in Hammersmith. Right? What happens is when you increase salaries at the top, the price of housing in the area that people at the top live goes up so that they need more money to be able to simply house themselves. And also the expectation goes up of what you should be able to do. Of course you should be able to go skiing in February and at Christmas and have a second home and a third home because your friends have those things. So it's not asking too much. And in this country, unlike Germany and France and Italy and so on, which don't have it in this country, you're going to need money for the school fees. If you send them to Eton or Westminster or numerous ones, you're talking quarter of a million pounds from the age of 15 through to 18, once you put the school trips in. And you have to do the school trips, otherwise you look like the poor kid at Eton. <laughs> have four children, and you need more money. Uh, there was an extreme example two years ago of the bankers were young men, younger than me, one was at Lloyd's, one was at Barclay, they're both on four million a year, and one found out the other one had got six. He immediately had to have six because that's how he valued himself. You know how much you're worth by how much do you, they pay you. The other reason why the salaries have gone up so high is because our marginal tax rate has gone down really lowly. There's a beautiful Stiglitz graph, uh, Piketty Stiglitz graph, I think, which shows change in marginal tax rates versus inequality over 40 years. <coughs> we now have some of the lowest marginal tax rates so that when that young banker goes to the board of the bank and says, I need an extra two million, they know he's going to get most of that two million. If you had a marginal tax rate of, say, 55% at half a million, 60 at a million, 65% at two million, these sounds pitifully low to you, but they're enough, <laughs> then the trustees of the bank know that most of the money they'll be supposedly giving that banker who needs the extra two million won't be going to that bank, it'll be going to the treasury. High marginal tax rates are really good ways of stopping people asking for more money. They don't raise much money, the higher you make the marginal tax rate, the less you actually get off high rate taxpayers, but the more you get off everybody else. Because when that bank doesn't give that person an extra two million, they can employ many cashiers to work in the rest of the bank. So that when you go to the bank, there might actually be somebody to help you, rather than having to queue, or not queue if you're in the super fast queue. Have you noticed the super fast queue? For people with a higher income? Or have they managed to hide it enough from you? <laughs> so the colour of your bank card tells you whether you're allowed to jump the queue in banks. Or even better, um, they know when you phone up call centres how much you're worth. So if you're hanging on for a long time on the call centre, it may be because your phone number is associated with a low-income household. Uh, you go through faster. So, so there are subtle ways. But we have got ourselves in a ridiculous situation. The most ridiculous statistic, which is one from Owen Jones in the establishment book, is that there are more bankers paid over a million pounds a year in the Barclays headquarters in Canary Wharf than there are in the whole of Japan in any industry put together. But in Japan, uh, works. And it's, it's very, it's a functioning society. 
there are people combating this. There's a lovely website that looks at pay ratios. Thousands of pay ratios are now up there. Uh, lots of people have agreed to put their pay ratios up. The National Audit Office now produces pay ratios for all parts of the civil service to stop pay going up at the top. Uh, lots of companies haven't replied to the email. Only one company, only one company, is where I'm going to, replied and said, we're not going to do this. And that company is Barclays Bank. Yeah. <laughs> really clever replying to that email, saying we're not willing to tell you what our pay ratio is. Right, so I'm going to abuse the chair's position and ask the final question, um, which is, is your solution then radical incrementalism? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's very short. Yeah. It is in a way. It's just practical. Radical influence. Not, not just because I'm a bit wimpy, <laughs> although I am, and I've got kids and I'm middle-aged. You know, revolution's ever so exciting when you're young. Um, <laughs> we... There are lots of ways in which we could get the equivalent of, of revolution, and they're all disasters, and you, you can go through them. And then you can put great hope in the fact that despite all of this and our lack of trust, we still are quite good at queuing, um, which is what you need in the event of a disaster. Uh, but the... <laughs> but radical incrementalism is what has worked in the past. It's what works in other countries. It's how the Swiss got to be the Swiss. They were more unequal is 40 years ago. The Swiss somehow decided collectively to become more equal and they did it. They stopped people from abroad buying their luxury housing so the Swiss can actually live in Swiss villages because they're quite pretty. You know, you might want to do that. Radical, slow revolution, incrementalism is it's the thing that has mainly worked in rich countries. The second most likely thing that has worked is losing a war. And you just don't want a war anyway, uh, let alone to lose it. But as I said earlier, if you want a prediction of the event, and I'm, I don't know what to think about this. I really do like Europe. I, I work with people from mainland Europe. But you often need a shock when you're a rich country to become normal. We were the richest country in the world 100 years ago. We don't even know the one that was the richest country in the world before us. It's the Netherlands. House prices peaked there in 1675. <laughs> they fell for 300 years, if you want a model. It's really hard if you were the world superpower and half the world was coloured pink to adjust to becoming to a normal country. We thought it was our industry that made us rich. We didn't realise it was our colonies. You know, there's no coincidence that we had a financial crisis in the 1970s, given that India was no longer there and most of Africa had managed to leave. So it's very, very hard for us to adjust to becoming normal, to realising we have to do enough to get the money. We can't just sit back. So they could, you might need a crisis. The crisis of leaving Europe, potentially, uh, could be the crisis that isn't incremental. The nearest we came to it was that vote in Scotland. If only 5.5% of the Scottish electorate had behaved differently, it was that close, if 5.5% had voted yes to leave, the next day you would have had a run on Stirling because suddenly you have this tiny currency where there hasn't been a run-on for years, no longer backed up by North Sea oil, potentially, in the future, only backed up by the supposed brilliance of our bankers and how good they are. If the Scots had voted to leave, I think we'd have had short-term economic catastrophe. If we vote to leave mainland Europe out of arrogance and thinking how great we are and how much greater we could be, it could be the fastest way to make us normal. Uh, rather than great, but I don't want to do it that way. Mm. I really don't want to lose the rights our children have got to go. They can all go and study somewhere for free. Germany's open to them. It's not that hard to learn German. You know, there's a £70,000 bribe to learn German than what you don't have to pay back. I feel less guilty working in a university in England, knowing that nobody actually has to come to university in England while we're still in the EU than I would do if we left. But I think leaving could be the thing which would actually finally knock us off this kind of harking back to try to be great again at a time when we owned half the planet. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.
I'd like to invite you for refreshments in the foyer and on behalf of the university, thank you so much for your attendance and your, your time. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Chairman. So my, my story is there's a really strong relationship between inequality and human rights violations. And I think that the story there wow. is that those people who want to keep this stuff quite willing to engage in quite nasty shit to keep people away. Because they've got so much to lose. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 Yes. Yeah.